Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. A very warm welcome to this discussion. I'm Jan Beagle, the Director General of the International Development Law Organization. For those who may not know us, IDLO is the only global intergovernmental organization exclusively devoted to promoting the rule of law and access to justice to advance peace, human rights, and sustainable development. I would like to extend our thanks to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which is cooperating with IDLO in bringing you this event, and also to our co-sponsors, the Human Rights Council core group on the Forum on Human Rights, Democracy and the Rule of Law, Morocco, Norway, Peru, the Republic of Korea, Romania, and Tunisia. The next edition of the forum will take place on the 16th and 17th of November on the theme of equal access to justice for all, a necessary element of democracy, rule of law, and human rights protection. This marks the first time that the council will focus the forum directly and specifically on justice and the rule of law. And I'm delighted to be here with such an experienced and distinguished group of panelists. Our keynote speaker is the Honorable Michael Kirby, President of the International Bar Association, Human Rights Institute, and former Justice of the High Court of Australia. Justice Kirby will speak via pre-recorded video as he is in Sydney and it is very late there. Justice Kirby asked me to convey to you his sincere regrets that he cannot join us in person. Before sharing a few thoughts of my own to get us started, let me welcome our panelists uh, in the order in which they will speak. Firstly, Mona Rishmawi, Chief of the Rule of Law, Equality and Non-Discrimination Branch of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Asa Regna, Deputy Executive Director, UN Women. Dihan Gordon Harrison, Attorney at Law and Children's Advocate of Jamaica. Gerald Abila, the founder of Barefoot Law, Uganda. And Diego Garcia Sayan, the Special Rapporteur of the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council, on the independence of judges and lawyers. Welcome to everyone. Now let me turn briefly to the theme of today's discussion. As the Secretary General said in opening the 46th session of the Human Rights Council last month, his call to action on human rights has a specific emphasis on repealing all discriminatory laws globally. Ensuring equality before the law and ending discrimination under the law is as good a starting place as any for our discussion on the Forum on Human Rights, Democracy and the Rule of Law and its theme this year of access to justice for all. Indeed, working with governments, United Nations system and civil society partners, the reform of constitutional, legal and regulatory frameworks is a central pillar of IDLO's work. We are very pleased, for example, to be partnering with UN Women in a joint initiative to identify and repeal the hundreds of laws discriminating against women and girls that are still on the books in countries in every region of the world. The COVID-19 pandemic, which has caused untold suffering across the globe, has also had an impact on the justice sector and made the lives of justice seekers more difficult. Whether they are seeking a remedy for disproportionate and overly broad lockdowns and restrictive measures, or the right to a speedy criminal trial, or protection from gender-based violence, or the right to benefit from scientific progress through equitable access to a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine. The political, economic, and social crisis generated by the pandemic and the exacerbation of inequalities has made good governance and the rule of law all the more important. As I said at the high-level segment of the Human Rights Council in February, even before most of us had ever heard of the coronavirus, we had been living in a distressed and unstable world, with increasing numbers of countries looking to go their own way, multilateralism dismissed in favor of nationalistic populism, human rights under pressure, and long-standing traditions of the rule of law under attack and weakened for short-term narrow political gains. In such circumstances, the decision of the Human Rights Council to dedicate this year the forum to human rights, democracy, and the rule of law could not be more timely. Access to justice is a human right in itself, and together with the rule of law, offers a concrete pathway to peace, good governance, human rights, democracy, and sustainable development. Thus, Sustainable Development Goal 16 on access to justice and strong and accountable institutions is not only an end in itself, 
but a cross-cutting enabler of the entire 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. By nurturing a culture of the rule of law, countries and communities everywhere can construct the essential infrastructure to narrow the gap between human rights in word and human rights in action. An objective of the Human Rights Council Forum and of this virtual discussion to assist in its planning is ultimately to help make access to justice a lived reality for all. Because access to justice for all is not only a clear moral imperative, it's also a necessary condition for sustaining human development as we recover from the pandemic and seek to build a better future for the generations to come. So before we turn to our keynote speaker and our panel, I would just like to mention that the session will be recorded and will be made available online. We'll hear the keynote address now, followed by a first round of interventions from our panelists. We will then open up the floor for questions. And for those who would like to ask a question to the panelists, please let us know via the chat feature um, by messaging uh, Q&A Secretariat. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Michael Kirby, President of the International Bar Association Human Rights Institute, and formerly from 1996 to 2009, Justice of the High Court of Australia. I first had the privilege to know Justice Kirby through his powerful advocacy to place human rights at the center of the response to HIV and AIDS and to counter discrimination against people living with and affected by HIV. Justice Kirby has been a leader and courageous voice for human rights in many different areas. In 2013, he was appointed by the Human Rights Council to lead a commission of inquiry into human rights abuses in North Korea. He has been active from the earliest stages of his professional life in promoting good governance and human rights in his country and internationally, and has been awarded some 30 honorary degrees from academic institutions around the world. It is my honor to present to you Justice Kirby's keynote address via pre-recorded video. And immediately after the video, we will return to our live in-person discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for that uh, generous introduction. Uh, I pay my respects to the participants uh, in this dialogue. And I pay my respects to Dr. Jan Beagle uh, Director General of IDLO, with whom uh, I've had the privilege of working uh, in uh, UN uh, AIDS and in other fields of endeavour relevant to human rights. Uh, I'm very glad to have the privilege of making this uh, keynote address, uh, and I wish I could be with you, and soon we will all be together at the end of this terrible time of trial and challenge, including challenges to universal human rights. In the Charter of the United Nations, in the first or second line of the Charter, and in the first line of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that came three years later in 1948, is an elusive word. Lawyers fix on words. And the elusive word is justice. It's this little word justice that exists in these two foundational documents uh, of the United Nations system. I remember a day when I was uh, in my infant school. Forgive me for talking of this uh, personal uh, remembrance but it does bring home to me the link I have with the very beginnings of the United Nations system and all the mighty developments, uh, successful and less successful that have followed. In 1944, I was sitting on the footpath outside my infant school and a great cavalcade went by and in the lead car of that cavalcade on its way to open uh, a new hospital for veterans of the Pacific War was a very great lady, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. And I feel that my eyes locked with Eleanor as she was going by. I was just a little boy of four or five. 
and she went past, but she had before her the great challenge of completing the task that was not completed at the time of the charter. Originally, it had been intended to include in the Charter of the United Nations uh, a statement of fundamental human rights, but time ran out. And the result was that a committee was established. Eleanor Roosevelt uh, became the chair of that committee. She worked hard, she banged the heads together, and ultimately there emerged the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a sort of Magna Carta for humanity and uh, the second part of the essential document, the Charter of the United Nations. And it contained at the beginning this commitment to the little word justice. And finding what that word justice has been both a professional and a personal challenge to me in the years that followed. And I had many privileges in those years meeting uh, John Humphrey, who was a professor from McGill University in Canada, who had been the person who first put the words on paper that became the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, and meeting my colleagues and working with them in the judiciary in Australia over uh, a period of 34 years, and working on tasks in the United Nations system over that time. These were the experiences of a lifetime in search of that elusive word justice. Uh, and uh, in our time in Australia, I was privileged to serve as chairman of the Law Reform Commission, as well as serving in courts of law as a judge for 34 years. And I can say that one of the proudest things uh, that I learned in my time in Australia was that never was there any corruption of myself or the other judges. We were serving justice in independent and impartial courts. And not to put too fine a point on it, we were rather pleased with ourselves and proud of ourselves, and maybe correctly so that we were uncorrupted and we decided the cases as they came before us and in accordance with our understanding of the law. And if we disagreed, we could dissent and it would be recorded and the people would judge and ultimately the law might change. But then I attended a conference of lawyers in Hobart, Tasmania. Lawyers have lots of conferences and this conference was attended by a very great German judge of a different legal system, the civilian legal system. And he started his address. His name was Wolfgang Zeidler. He was a judge of the Verfassungsgerichtshof, the constitutional court of the then West Germany. And he said, in your country, like all the Anglo-Saxon countries, you have a marvelous system of justice. You have completely independent judges and a very skillful legal profession, but it's a very expensive form of justice. In fact, it's the Rolls-Royce system of justice. In, a, in Germany, he said, in Germany, we just have a Volkswagen system of justice. And it's not as perfect as your system of justice. And there was a pause. And he then asked, but how many citizens can afford a Rolls Royce? And how many citizens can afford a Volkswagen? And that question hung in the air as he left the podium. And it is this question that must be addressed by systems of justice everywhere. The very nature of an organized legal system with highly talented and very experienced and lengthily trained lawyers is that they tend to be very accomplished and rather expensive. They expect 
to be expensive because they've spent all that time studying and getting to be lawyers. And so this is the challenge. What does justice mean? Uh, what does the rule of law mean? How do universal human rights operate? And how do they operate in democracies? And that is the puzzle. And it's a puzzle that won't go away. And it's a puzzle to which the forum that has been established by the Human Rights Council uh, is going to address itself when it comes to looking at how to convert the fine language of the resolutions setting up the forum uh, and setting up this dialogue, how to convert those uh, fine uh, ideals into actual delivery of the rule of law and of human rights in democracies and how we do that is the puzzle. Uh, the actuality is something that cannot exist alongside too much self-satisfaction. I've gone to so many glorious sessions in my life where the lawyers dress up and rightly so and celebrate their achievements. But lurking in the back of my mind has been Dr. Wolfgang Zeidler's question, how many can afford the system and what can we do to make the system more accessible? And that is the question that IDLO has addressed itself to, and I applaud the questions it has set for us and is addressing to the discussions that will lead up to the meeting of the forum. How to empower the independent legal decision-making as it merges out of the period of COVID-19 and as the special procedures that have been introduced in our nation states to deal with the pandemic, the lockdowns and the compulsion, how do we ensure that we uh, achieve justice and what is the obligation of lawyers but also of non-lawyers and of democratic legislatures and of young people in ensuring justice as we move out of COVID and into the world uh, as it was, but changed by our experience over the last uh, year and more. How do we invest in legal aid? And are there different forms of legal aid that can encourage more people to get to justice so that it isn't beyond the pocket of ordinary citizens and so that real uh, justice can be accomplished by ordinary folk. How do we ensure that vulnerable people amongst the vulnerable groups in our society can have access to justice, especially sure that women and girls can find their voice in the challenges of justice. This is a major issue in the world today. Also a major issue is how racial minorities can find their voice in the struggle for justice and how indigenous people can have their voice heard, how LGBTIQ people sexual minorities of whom I am a member can have their voice heard, how all of these specially vulnerable groups can know the word justice, can know that it's there in the charter and it's there on the first line of the Universal Declaration. How can they have access to justice uh, and how can that be made affordable? How can we use alternative dispute resolution with which professionally I have had some experience since leaving the court system and how we can use informal systems of justice consistently with United Nations principles to bring justice in an affordable way to the people who have problems so that the rule of law is not just a theory but it is an actuality. 
and how can we rebuild the multilateralism that was such a valuable part of the activities of the international community uh, in the years following the Charter and the Universal Declaration and all the great uh, treaties of the United Nations and the great institutions of the United Nations that have followed. So these are the commitments that IDLO has laid before us in this dialogue, and they are practical commitments. And they come to me from a lifetime, really, 34 years as a judge in Australia, and as has been said, many activities uh, for the United Nations since. One lesson I learned in all of those activities was the importance of a highly accomplished legal profession, well-trained and not corrupted, dedicated to deciding matters according to law. But equally important was to open our ears to the voices of people who need to be heard if we are to understand what the rule of law means in practice. Uh, in my days uh, in Australia, I worked in the Law Reform Commission and we always had public hearings to hear the voices. In my days in the United Nations, in the work on the Commission of Inquiry on North Korea, we did our job in a slightly different way. We had public hearings, we listened to the voices. Listening only to ourselves is a way that can lead to error. Listening to the voices of those who are affected, including the vulnerable, including the marginalized, is what Jan Beagle and I learned in our work together on HIV AIDS, in UN AIDS and before UN AIDS. And it's what IDLO is now doing in its important work for law and development of human rights, democracy, the rule of law and justice. I will thank Justice Kirby on behalf of all of us for his inspiring words, which provide, I think, a wonderful overview for us to launch our panel discussion. So let's now hear from our panelists on how they see our rule of law trends and the path towards strengthening access to justice for all. The High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, and her colleagues have worked tirelessly with the Human Rights Council and specifically its core group on the forum to promote approaches to problems that are grounded in human rights and importantly, in the rule of law as an enabler of human rights. And I'm very pleased to welcome to this discussion, Mona Rishmawi, the Chief of the Rule of Law, Equality and Non-Discrimination Branch in OHCHR and one of IDLO's closest partners in Geneva. Uh, I want to thank OHCHR and you personally, Mona, uh, for our cooperation uh, in the planning and delivery of uh, today's discussion. And we'd be grateful if you'd share your knowledge about what the Council and OHCHR seek to achieve through the forum, what we should all expect in November, and how people around the world can participate. Mona, you have the floor. Thank you so much, and thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone wherever you are, I, it is really my huge pleasure uh, to be with you in this, uh, in this discussion uh, with many good friends and colleagues and really under your leadership, uh, Jan Beagle. Of course, I know, your work, I know you for many years and I know your wonderful contribution to many aspects of our work, particularly as uh, a UN stellar actually, in, in a number of fields. So thank you very much for inviting us. And it's always a pleasure to, co to collaborate with you and uh, with EDLO. Thank you also for IDLO for organizing this uh, really important uh, online event in support of the third session of the forum on human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, which uh, will be held uh, in November this year. I think we've been having meaningful co collaboration for many, many years now, and your uh, idea law's contribution has really helped us strengthening the forum as a leading UN space for discussing these three interrelated themes. 
I also would like to uh, thank the uh, the uh, the states and the missions who have actually uh, helped in bringing this together and continue to support the forum. In particular, Morocco, Norway, uh, Peru, the Republic of Korea, Romania, and Tunisia. And add our uh, our thanks to your thank you to your thanks, um, uh, Mrs. Beagle, for this uh, for their continued support to our work. Let me just share with you a few thoughts about how we see this theme. The forum's theme this year is access to justice for all, a necessary element for democracy, rule of law, and human rights protection. Already, Justice Michael Kirby, and you know, he's an incredible speaker, so I'm not going to even try to uh, speak in a way he spoke. So uh, he already, uh, you know, shed important light about how this theme is so critical and so important to us today. Even before the COVID-19, it was estimated that 1.5 billion people could not fully enjoy their right to access justice. In particular, economically marginalized individuals, women, persons with disabilities, indigenous peoples, minorities, LGBTI people and others have long struggled to access justice. Systemic discrimination based on ethnicity, race, gender, or economic status is often at the core of the problem. As you may know, we have been particularly con concentrating in the, last, uh, uh, in the last year on the issue of racial justice. Our High Commissioner recently highlighted before the Human Rights Council the difficulties to achieve justice experienced by people of African descent whose, life, whose family members have been killed by law enforcement officials. When they talk to us, they talk about lengthy processes and delays, little or no legal aid or financial or psychological support, and harassment and intimidations are just a few in the impediments that they regularly face. The pandemic only made matters worse for people and for justice systems across the world. Here again, the marginalized communities have been particularly marginalized. For example, access to justice and support services for survivors of gender-based violence, another key theme that we focus on with our colleagues with in UN Women and work together in a very collaborative and excellent way, so access to justice for survivors of gender-based violence were further restricted due to COVID-19. At the same time, data in many countries shows that domestic violence have increased to become a pandemic on its own right. Moreover, emergency measures have restricted access to courts. And here, our, I'm sure our uh, esteemed special rapporteur, uh, Diego Garcia uh, Sayan, an old friend and colleague, will also uh, highlight some of these issues. It showed, uh, it slowed down operations precisely at the time when legal oversight protections and services are not, are most needed, are, are, are most needed. Weakened judiciaries have not always been in a position to play the rightful role as part of the checks and balances are and, uh, and that are essential in any democracies. As we enter a new phase in this global crisis, and we are trying to build, we are trying to build back better from what we learned. I have three. I would like to highlight three main areas that I think are essential in this journey. The first one is a question of trust. Trust must be restored. Several studies have shown that the current global trust, there is current global trust in government and institutions, have dropped to a very low level. Confidence in public institutions is critical to enhance people's cooperation. And we all, state governments need this cooperation and this very difficult times of the pandemic. Here again, we, fin we face a gender trust gap. Evidence, evidence shows that women trust, uh, women trust in public institution less than men due to structural, and, uh, structural inequalities, discrimination, gender power dynamics, and exclusion from decision-making spaces. Our ongoing consultations with people of African descent 
also reveal how trust, uh, tr this trust in the system results uh, in, in uh, 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 results in built up. It comes, it comes from decades of being ignored, having their concerns dismissed, and being treated with contempt. It comes from feeling and being a feeling, feeling of being unheard, undervalued, and dehumanized. To gain people's trust, public institution needs to demonstrate respect for the human dignity and to be inclusive, responsive, effective, and accountable to all members of society. The second issue that I'd like to highlight is meaningful participation. This needs to increase. People should be involved in identifying the gaps and finding solutions to access to justice deficits. Public consultation should become an automatic part of decision-making uh, playbook. In addition, people will need to be further empowered to play a meaningful role. Initiatives aiming at su supporting legal education, access to legal information, and, right, uh, and rights awareness are concrete steps towards empowerment. Evidence shows that promoting participation have a positive impact on levels of trust. And the third and last point on this cluster that I'd like to uh, mention is that justice needs to be people-centered. Already Michael Kirby spoke a lot about this, stuff, this issue, but I would like to just mention a few points in, in this regard. Justice is often seen as a specialized field and a technical field. It tends to be procedural, and as Michael talked about, it's about billing and it's about we as lawyers feeling important. But it has to be people-centered because a people-centered approach to legal services that addresses existing power imbalances will make these services more accessible, more affordable, more available, targeted and responsible to those most in need. And it, this will contribute to Peace and peaceful coexistence amongst nations and within societies as goal uh, 16 of the SDG tells us to do. Human rights compliance, formal and informal systems create opportunities for all to participate fully in their societies. And as, add, as, uh, as an added benefit, engaging with communities and civil society organization in all their diversity to identify priority areas for support is critical to ensure that the recovery plans are locally owned, evidence-based, gender responsive, sustainable, and, uh, and respond to everyone's needs. And as I am closing, let me just say a word about the forum, uh, just to give you a bit of practical information, and I will close with that. The forum uh, is uh, the Forum on Human Rights, Democracy, and the Rule of Law, as you know, is the name is a platform for promoting dialogue. It's really about dialogue and cooperation on issues pertaining to the relationship between these areas. As such, it provides opportunities for identifying and analyzing best practices for states in their efforts to secure access to justice for all. The forum is scheduled to take place from 16 to 17 November this year. Uh, and will be open to a wide range of stakeholders. We invite you all uh, to register for it. It will be, I think, uh, virtual as we are now used to it. Our office has already uh, issued a call for input for the agenda of this, uh, for this forum. And we are very, we already received a number of suggestions. Uh, this particular meeting today, and thank you for that again, IDLO will provide important opportunities for, uh, for really uh, getting new ideas and receiving new ideas on these agendas. So please don't hesitate to make concrete suggestions in this regard as you take the floors. The lessons learned and the examples recorded in the chair's summary of the discussions and recommendations will no doubt help states moving forward in recognizing everyone's ability to access justice and receive and receive effective ju uh, judicial services, which is the goal that we are all working to achieve. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for this partnership with, uh, with, with our office. 
Thank you, Mona, for that excellent overview, framing the former for us and uh, particularly emphasizing the critical importance of the theme. It's now my honor to introduce my friend, Asa Regna, Deputy Executive Director of UN Women. As many of you will be aware, Asa and her colleagues at UN Women are very busy these days, helping to ensure a strong conclusion to the 65th session of the Commission on the Status of Women, uh, as well as launching the Generation Equality Forum. So Asa, thank you for making time in your packed schedule in New York uh, these days to share your thinking and UN Women's work on access to justice for women and girls. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Excellencies, UN colleagues, other colleagues and friends. And thank you, uh, Jan, for inviting me today. I'm really happy to be here. It makes a lot of sense uh, to discuss these issues uh, combined. And I want to thank you personally, because my first year in New York, uh, you were still in New York. We were so happy to have you. <laughs> and you really shared uh, your knowledge, experience, uh, showed a lot of sisterhood and um, with a lot of your sense of humor to me, with me. And uh, that was highly appreciated when I was uh, very fresh in this role in New York. So thank you so much for that. So today's topic is very important to the ongoing uh, theme of the Commission on the Status of Women. As you know, we uh, hold this uh, meeting um, a year after a crisis, uh, the COVID crisis. And we all know that the socioeconomic impacts of the crisis have been hitting harder women harder than men uh, in almost all measurable ways. And one thing we know is that there is lack or, of access to justice coming out of this crisis and that builds on, uh, uh, on, um, on, on the facts that access to justice for women uh, is not there at all as it should be in the world. So I do think that uh, it's very timely to discuss these issues and also, as you said, uh, Jan, in relation to the Generation Equality Forums and that initiative, which is there to push for implementation of uh, our common goals and the international agreements on gender equality, uh, together with uh, member states, with uh, civil society and with uh, pr the private sector. So. Um, I wanted to, although I know that many of you are experts and you know which uh, violations we talk about when we talk about women's needs for access to justice, and you know what, what uh, happens to women. Uh, justice and, and access to justice, as we've heard before, is extremely important, obviously, but impunity is a very big problem when it comes to violations of women's rights in many uh, aspects. So I want to still uh, remind a bit of the human rights violations that women and girls specifically of all social classes are confronted with in the world. Already prior to the pandemic, uh, 243 million women and girls aged 15 to 49 years across the world were subjected to sexual or physical violence by an intimate, often male partner uh, in the previous 12 months. As an effect uh, or, or an, an side effect of the stay at home orders, which were often implemented uh, by an estimated 162 countries in the world during COVID, uh, we have seen an average of a five fold increase in domestic violence across the globe in recent times. Uh, that is because um, women were um, in confinement with their perpetrators when women uh, lived together with violent men. UNODC's new global study on homicide suggests that a total of 87,000 women were intentionally killed in the year of 2017. More than half of them, almost 60%, uh, were killed by intimate partners or other family members meaning that as much as 137 women across the world are killed by a family, uh, killed by a member of their own family every day. More than a third, 30,000 of, of the women intentionally killed in the year of 2017 were killed by their current or former intimate male partner. 
somebody who they should normally be able to trust, be defended by or protected by, be respected by for sure. These figures are based on reported cases. As most violations of the human rights of women and girls are not reported, these figures might only be the tip of the iceberg, iceberg as we know. This is especially true in conflict and crisis settings and in communities where it is still taboo to speak about certain forms of abuse or where the law enforcement institutions and, and uh, law enforcement institutions and legal services are either not available, or uh, they might be inaccessible due to distance, cost, or institutional bias as well. Sadly, also, still potential viola violations are not made easier by state-sanctioned uh, laws which place girls at risk of marriage, prevent women from owning and inheriting property, um, deny them equal rights as parents in marriage and divorce, and in the sphere of participation in employment and public life more broadly. And in these situations, women are impacted by both their personal and situational circumstances, many of which overlap to deepen discrimination and place them furthest away from justice systems and justice. And these barriers are even greater for women and girls facing intersectional discrimination, including young women, women and girls with disabilities, as well as indigenous women and girls. And I just now come from a young women's forum discussing all of this and uh, it is really a reality for them. We at UN Women are address addressing some of these issues in partnership with governments, civil society organizations, uh, intergovernmental bodies, and of course, the UN system. For example, in 2019, we launched a report called Equality in Law for Women and Girls by 2030, a multi-stakeholder strategy to accelerate action. Since the inception of our current strategic plan for UN Women, we have reached over 300,000 women with, uh, to help them with legal aid services. And our strategies there have included working very closely with women lawyers associations, bar associations, and women judges associations. UN Women also supports women's access to transitional justice uh, in conflict affected countries. Furthermore, we support the documentation of women's rights violations by independent investigations created by the Human Rights Council. Since we were created 10 years ago, or almost 11, our approach has been to deploy a gender advisor or sexual and gender biased violence investigator to the council's commissions of inquiry and fact-finding missions through an innovative partnership with OHCHR. And thank you for the partnership. I totally agree with your comments earlier, Mona. And justice rapid response. These exper uh, experts ensure that violations are documented in line with international standards so that victims and survivors can ultimately access justice. We also very much remain committed to addressing the gender gap in the judiciary and continue to work with governments in the design of affirmative action policies to promote women's participation in justice delivery. So UN Women welcomes the theme of equal access to justice for all for, uh, 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 for all for the third session of the Human Rights Council Forum scheduled for no November 2021. So in uh, some ideas for consideration, uh, we think it would be important to ensure a strong gender perspective in that session, and I hear already that you, you want to work along those lines. In building back better from this uh, pandemic, we need to be mindful of the important lessons it has taught us. For example, the important need to undertake justice business differently and more efficiently through increased digitalization. Uh, while at the same time ensuring that women can effectively access modernized justice systems through appropriate technology and services. So this means that every single woman must have access to a mobile, uh, every single woman might, must have access to a mobile phone to communicate with access services and receive uh, information. We also 
uh, think or we believe that we need to be creative in the delivery of justice when national conditions require that. We should make use of alternative dispute resolution in an ethical way, including partnering more with informal justice and indigenous and minority people's justice mechanisms. However, very important, this should not undermine accountability for crimes committed uh, or substitute clear prevention measures for women at risk of violence, such as the use of restraining orders. Finally, we need to increase the participation of women as decision makers in the justice se sector to ensure that women effectively participate in decisions which impact structural changes to the justice uh, sector during this COVID crisis and beyond. Throughout the world, women's participation in justice delivery should be increased to promote its transform transformational potential and the essence of equality before the law. And Jan, I was thinking uh, before I joined the UN in this capacity, I was a cabinet minister. And um, when women take on those kinds of roles, uh, they do encounter threats and different types of harassment and, 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 and that kind of violence. When women speak publicly, the, those reactions are often um, harsher, they are quicker, and they're often sexualized. That happened also to me, and I received several severe uh, threats, I thought. But not a lot happened until all of a sudden one of the persons who, who sent a, an actual envelope to me uh, turned out to have had a violent uh, a record for having committed violent crimes. His DNA happened to be on that particular letter. And uh, so there was a, a, a trial against him and he was sentenced to eight years of um, severe unlawful threat <laughs> against me. And although this was one of several threats against me, I realized when I had that sentence in my hand, and eight years is a long time in the Swedish system that this was, I was very privileged in my position. I had all the support I could get from police and I had protection while I was working and all of that. But it did still frighten me uh, to receive these threats. I was thinking about my children. And when I had that sentence in my hand, I realized how important it was. And I somehow, I do, I had understood that before, but having with that sentence in my hand, it really sent a strong message. He was wrong, I was right. I can continue what I, what I do. I have the right to do that. And uh, this, this, uh, that kind of justice was extremely important, even to me under the most privileged circumstances. And that actually strengthened my, my understanding of how important it is to, to work for this for every woman, every woman everywhere. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much, Asa, uh, for talking to us about the gender justice gap and also sharing your own personal experience. I think that, that makes it very real. Uh, to all of us. Uh, we in IDLO attach uh, the highest value to our partnership uh, with you and women, um, including the, the, the very important work you do to overturn many discriminatory laws that are still on the books uh, in many countries, and also the work uh, with survivors um, of violations. And that is so important, um, as, as you have said. We're very pleased to join in making concrete commitments as part of generation equality. Um, we you. know that you will have to leave us uh, shortly um, and thank you again for being with us today, and we look forward to continuing uh, to work with you. Uh, thank you another group of thank you. Another group of people that frequently face challenges in seeking and accessing justice is, of course, children and young people. Millions of children around the world confront violations of their human rights in their daily lives, and of course, in the context of intergenerational justice. It will be children and future generations uh, who will experience most severely the impact of, of climate change and other eras of the ways of today uh, in the way that we fail to protect our societies and our environment. And our next speaker is someone who knows these issues very well, uh, attorney at law, Dehan Gordon Harrison. Ms. Gordon Harrison is Jamaica's children's advocate. She was appointed in 2012 and she is charged with safeguarding and advancing the best interests and the rights of all children in Jamaica, reviewing policies and laws that may impact upon children and making recommendations to parliament and ministers of government 
And since 2015, she has also served as National Rapporteur on Trafficking in Persons. So thank you so much for joining us today, Ms. Gordon Harrison. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Your Excellencies, of course, the uh, Director General, uh, Dr. Jan Beadle, my fellow panelists and participants all, it really is a privilege to share with you uh, this morning. I know that we are doing a timed event. And so uh, in the interest of ordering my thoughts, I've created a very short uh, PowerPoint that will guide my comments this morning. So I will share screen and get right into that. All right, can you confirm if you're seeing my, uh, my slides? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I am focusing this morning on access to justice for children and trafficked persons. Now, I've started with just a contextual, geographical contextual situation. So Jamaica is a very small island in the Caribbean, and we are positioned about 150 kilometers south of Cuba and 190 kilometers west of Haiti. North America, uh, particularly uh, Florida, is our closest neighbor uh, to the north. And uh, we are about 4,213 square miles in terms of our area. We are an independent British Commonwealth country and a common law jurisdiction. We're currently classified as a small island developing state, but we are transitioning to a middle income country and we have earmarked that to occur by 2030 in keeping with our development goals. And in terms of population, we're almost as small as our geographic look, uh, uh, dimensions because we're just about 2.9 million in terms of our population. Now, generally, as we all know here, access to justice involves normative legal protection and awareness, which supports sustainable peace, as these principles provide an alternative to violence when the need arises for persons to resolve conflicts and disputes. Access to justice also promotes the need for people to be treated fairly according to law, and if not, being able to get appropriate redress. How does this translate to the Jamaican context and the Jamaican reality? So in Jamaica, there is a formal recognition that the rule of law is supreme and that fairness dictates that all citizens, and in fact, all persons in Jamaica, should be treated equally, and if not, redress is available. There's a special focus that we award to our most vulnerable, and this includes children and victims of trafficking. So what then is the legislative framework and broad context in Jamaica? So we've, I've done a visual, because of course the Supreme Law is the constitution of Jamaica. Within that constitution is the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms, and I've uplifted two pieces of legislation, the Child Care and Protection Act on the left, which deals with children, and the Trafficking in Persons legislation, which deals with trafficked persons. Now, the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms uh, is found in Chapter 3 of our Constitution. We enacted it in 2011, and it provides that every citizen is entitled to fundamental rights and freedoms by virtue of their inherent dignity as persons in a free and democratic society. And there's a right to equality before the law. Section 13.3, paragraph K, so paragraph one, stipulates that there is a right of every child to be protected by virtue of his or her status of being a minor or as part of the family, society, or state. Section 16 speaks about the protection of the right to process. And it says that in relation to civil rights and obligations that an individual may wish to pursue or in legal proceedings, whether criminal or civil, there is a right to a fair hearing within a reasonable time by an independent and impartial court that is established by law. And section 19 of the charter speaks about the application for redress in the event of actual contravention of these rights or the likelihood of that contravention and the application lies in the Supreme Court with a right of appeal to our Court of Appeal. Now, access to justice for children is really encapsulated within our local legislation by the Child Care and Protection Act of 2004, which really outlines the country's obligations to children. The CCPA is the overarching law, and it's a direct derivative of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, 
which Jamaica ratified in 1991. Our legislation creates an obligation to all children in Jamaica, whether they're Jamaicans or not, whether they live here permanently or not. And it concretizes a rights-based approach within the Jamaican context. All stakeholders must be guided by what is in the best interest of the child in all circumstances and in the decision-making processes involving children. The CCPA saw to the establishment of certain critical institutions that are focused on the provision of dedicated services and access to redress for children. So for example, we have a special arm of our local police force that treats with the investigation of criminal matters uh, in which children feature as victims. We have children's courts and children's courts judges. We have a children's registry that tracks statistically the reports of alleged instances of abuse of children. We have the CDA, which is a government entity that deals with the protection of safe living environments for children. And then we have the office that I'm privileged to lead, the Office of the Children's Advocates, which really deals with the integrity of the system and accountability mechanism. So the Office of the Children's Advocate uh, was established first in February 2006, and we are an independent commission of parliament. Our mandate is to enforce and protect the rights of children and to promote their best interests, so more like an ombudsman-like role. But in addition to that, the Children's Advocate reviews laws, policies, and practices and services provided by relevant government authorities we give advice to parliament and other persons in matter, on matters relating to children, and we investigate reports against relevant authorities that are alleged to have breached a child's rights or adversely impacted his or her best interests. So a snapshot of the role of the children's advocate, I won't go into it too much, but suffice it to say, we're mandated to protect and enforce, and I stress enforce, the rights and best interests of children. And we enforce through our investigative arm, and we have the ability, if we find that there has been a violation, to actually institute proceedings against someone who has violated that child's right to ensure that the child not only gets access to justice, but gets access to very appropriate remedies to right those wrongs. The children's advocate uh, and the courts we have on the section four of the CCPA that the court is required to contact the advocate where a child is deemed to be in need of legal representation, whether as an accused child uh, in conflict with the law or as a child who is before the court as a victim and needs that special protection. And as I said before, the advocate is empowered to initiate proceedings other than criminal ones before any court or tribunal and we can intervene as amicus curiae in, non, in criminal matters as well on behalf of the child. The children's advocate also has special jurisdiction to issue guidance on best practice in relation to any matter concerning the rights or best interests of children. And in 2013, for instance, I issued the child justice guidelines, which really establish standards that guide judges, prosecutors, the police, and other stakeholders in the justice system to adopt children, to adopt child appropriate strategies, sorry, based on their rights and best interests. I spoke about the powers of investigation, which I'm not going to go over in the interest of time, but suffice it to say, we can investigate anyone, including government entities and their representatives, members of parliament, et cetera, and take the steps, as I said, depending on what those investigations reveal, to hold them accountable on behalf of children. The advocate also has judicial authority for purposes of special statutory hearings that consider again allegations of breaches of children's rights and best interests. And at the end of those hearings, I have to give a reasoned finding in writing and then determine what is the best way forward. Now, access of just to justice for, traf for trafficking persons. So the Trafficking in Persons Prevention, Suppression and Punishment Act of 2007 embodies the Palermo Protocol in the Jamaican context. We have a victim-centered approach and we also adhere to the do no harm principle. Human trafficking, of course, is recognized as a grave human rights violation and the need for victims to be protected is emphasized throughout our responses. 
what are some of the responses to TIP locally? So since 2007, we have had various amendments to our legislation. For example, we have increased penalties for persons convicted. We have looked at the victim's right to restitution during a trial, which is new for us because in our criminal proceedings, we don't normally talk about compensation to the victim. We have judge alone trials now that are possible. And this is of course aimed at shortening the time involved in resolving these matters and having less impact on the victim because of more timely trials. And we have the victim being insulated from prosecution in relation to acts done as a result of or during the trafficking experience. We also have a national task force, uh, which is really a multi-stakeholder group that has civil society, government entities, and so on, that are charged with the implementation of anti-tip policies and practices throughout the country. And they have three subcommittees, the prevention, protection, and prosecution. We also have a specialized anti-tip vice squad in our local police force. We have a specialized unit in the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions who advise on these matters and also prosecute them. And of course, there's the appointment of the National Rapporteur, myself. And this happened by virtue of a cabinet decision in January of 2015 to create a more objective reporting system on the issue of trafficking in persons. We report on violations of the rights of victims, as well as discrimination, threats, or use of violence, harassment, intimidation, or reprisals directed at persons exercising these rights. Two examples of the work that I've done since being rapporteur is we have created and disseminated an e-learning tool, which has been really aimed at increasing the capacity of stakeholders to identify and rescue victims of trafficking and to disrupt human trafficking situations. Additionally, we have issued a victim survivor's handbook that educates victims of trafficking about their rights, avenues through which to seek redress and access to support services. Closing comments, therefore. Challenges remain in terms of both financial and human resources, knowledge gaps and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, but Jamaica's institutions remain committed to justice for all. We have had to, certainly when treating with children and trafficking victims, applied innovative and creative strategies to maintain their access to justice. And some of these include social media platforms with very creative and targeted messaging, uh, the introduction of a child helpline, which is to come shortly, and mobile and community interventions. With that, I want to thank you for your time and for affording me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gordon Harrison, uh, for talking to us about these important roles of child advocate and, and national uh, rapporteur. I think uh, Asa spoke about uh, impunity being, being a problem and protecting the rights uh, of women and girls. And I think you have shown us how important accountability mechanisms are very interesting. Uh, our next panelist, uh, Gerald Abila uh, from Uganda is a great friend of IDLO and I would say a true agent of change. In fact, Gerald has been named as a legal rebel by the American Bar Association uh, as a pioneer of the legal innovation movement in Africa. Uh, Gerald is the founder of Barefoot Law, uh, which through the innovative use of digital technology brings legal services to people uh, including in remote rural areas and empowers people to develop legal solutions for their justice needs. So Gerald, we're delighted that you're with us today to tell us about your pioneering work and how the Human Rights Council's forum can help you um, to achieve our goals and perhaps help us all to become legal rebels. Gerald, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Jan, for that wonderful uh, introduction and moderation and uh, for the invitation for me to speak here today. I'm very grateful to learn and to exchange knowledge. I'd like to start by, uh, by thanking the IDEA Law in cooperation with the UN Office for the High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, the Human Rights Council, the core group for the focus on human rights, democracy and rule of law for convening this, uh, th these deliberations. Uh, to Honorable Michael Kakti, his uh, keynote was wonderful. And I'm glad he was able to make it despite the, the time constraints on, on his side. And I would like to start off my presentation from something that he said. 
the Honorable Michael Kirkby mentioned in his uh, wonderful keynote, an analogy of justice systems uh, from his meeting with Dr. Wolfgang, I hope I get that right, uh, who was a justice of the German Constitutional Court on the civil law system being a VW system of justice and uh, the common law system being uh, a Rolls Royce uh, system of, of justice. But how many citizens can afford a Rolls Royce? How many citizens can afford a VW or a Volkswagen? Where I come from, not many can even afford a bicycle. Not many can even afford this, this justice that was alien to them until hardly a hundred years ago. And yet in the words of Dr. Wolfgang, I come from a system that is based on the common law system of justice, a Rolls Royce. So for me, how many in Uganda or how many in many parts of the world can afford a Rolls Royce or even a VW system of justice? For me, those are questions of reflection as a lawyer. But my question more is, I would love to own a Rolls Royce. I would love to have access to a Rolls Royce system of justice. But how can I get as many poor and vulnerable people as possible to access this Rolls Royce system of justice? And this is my perspective. How can we use, or how can we make access a reality? How can we leverage these uh, new and emerging technologies that we have to make as many people as possible access the Rolls Royce system of justice? And I would like us to envision a world in which everyone has access to justice, has a starting point, a future in which access to justice is not only a reality, but in the words of our uh, of Jan Beagle in her opening remarks, in a world in which access to justice is a lived reality, what would such a future look like? What would a future in which access to justice is a lived reality look like? For me and for barefoot law, such a future would be one in which the law is ubiquitous, one in which the law is merely a click of a button away, one in which access to justice is is universal and one in which all persons, regardless of their gender, their social, their social stratification, their geographical location, are able to use the law to protect not only themselves, but their communities and their families. And I would like us to get back to these deliberations and try to imagine how such a future can be achieved with current technologies and resources and where possible. I would like us to think outside the box. Imagine what technologies might arise in future and how can we use these technologies to achieve this aim? How can we use these technologies, real and those that are coming up in future, to achieve a world in which access to justice is a lived reality? The key word is lived. How can we use this technology towards that aim? I would like to tell you that such a world is possible and we can leverage, we can leverage new and emerging technologies towards such a world. It was because of this remote possibility some years ago that we founded Barefoot Law. It's close to 10 years ago now. As, uh, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, through the innovative use of digital technologies, our work at Barefoot Law is to empower people to develop legal solutions to their justice needs while at the same time eliminating access to justice barriers. The key word here is to empower people to develop justice solutions or legal solutions for their justice. And this is where I and Barefoot Law believe technology can play a key role. We will not use technology to replicate lawyers, but we will use technology as lawyers to empower people to develop solutions to their justice needs. And our goal is to make this available to 50 million people across Africa by 2030. So I hope that uh, in 2030, when we're having an idea law forum to look back at SDG 16, I will come and tell you how with technologies we were able to reach or not able to reach 50 million people across Africa. But how will this relate to human rights and the rule of law? Or how does all this connect to human rights and the rule of law? 
I, I honestly believe if we make access to justice available for all, if we make this a lived reality, which is a word I'm starting to like, then more people will use the law to prevent and resolve their disputes peacefully, leading to less conflict. Strengthening the rule of law begins with ensuring access to justice for all, more so for the poor and vulnerable populations, including, and I must stress this has already been stressed by our previous speakers, women, youth, and children. And today in a world of new and emerging technologies, making access to justice available for these populations requires us to think differently, not only in thoughts, but in actions as well. I, I sometimes think I'm naive, sometimes think I'm a legal rebel, <laughs> uh, but I believe these new and emerging technologies will give us an opportunity to combat many of the problems we are facing today problems in the justice system, problems such as transparency, openness, access, costs, and so many others. In fact, in my free time, I love to try and problem solve justice needs using technology. Because, and there is no problem in the justice system that technology cannot contribute towards its resolution. If we make access to justice for all available, then more people will use this as a fundamental process in, uh, in not only in their disputes, but in their dispute resolution uh, processes, both from the formal justice system, but again, from the informal justice system or the traditional system of justice. And this is where I think new and emerging technologies, as well as creative thinking, we cannot look at these in isolation of creative thinking. So this is where they play a key role. And by fusing all these elements, we can enable or we can develop approaches in which individuals and communities find and exercise these justice solutions. And I believe when that happens, then we are likely, or we are more than ever likely to move towards a point in which access to justice is a lived reality. But in order for us to reach there, we must join forces. We must join efforts to ensure access to justice for all and start with bringing together the various sectors that play sometimes overlapping, but, uh, but complementary roles. And, and I believe it's a two-way collaborative effort right from the international policy level through dialogues like this, but it trickles down to the grassroots between government, civil society, private sector, and funders from the grassroots right up with the knowledge exchange to the international policy level, again, through dialogues like this. But as I end, I would like to, to touch on something else relating to new and emerging technologies. It's, it's not yet a point of, uh, of very much discussion at present, but I believe it will be a point of discussion in future. And I believe in 2030, when we are going back towards our SDG 16 and looking at how we've achieved or not achieved these goals, we will get to a point where one of the biggest injustices we may see in the near future will be between those who have access to new and emerging technologies and those who do not. This variance in access will most likely increase the gap between the haves and the have not the poor and the rich, and we've seen a perfect example of this in the health sector with regards to the COVID-19 vaccine access and distribution. And so with a, with a platform that, uh, that this dialogue provides, I would like us to have in mind, how can we prepare to combat such injustices that are likely to arise in the future? As new and emerging technologies come, we will likely need to change our understanding of human rights and what justice means, the whole concept and idea of justice that Honorable Kakli mentioned in his uh, keynote address will need to be realigned in light of uh, the new and emerging technologies that we will come across. In future, access to justice might include access to these technologies or might include the benefits of such technologies. Because I believe some of these technologies the new and emerging technologies 
will form part of the fundamental human rights that we talk or reference today. And on reflection, I would like to end with this question for which I'm happy to discuss, to learn further. How can we in future ensure technology justice? It's the term I just coined as I was preparing for this presentation. But like I mentioned in future, certain new and emerging technologies will form fundamental human rights. How shall we ensure equal access to these technologies for people like me from a region like mine, such that uh, the benefits are available to all, not only from uh, the access to justice perspective. How can we use these new and emerging technologies to bring about more equity in society, to cater to our more pressing needs, and to use them as a foundation for fairness in our society? How can we scale these technologies to solve pressing development challenges of society? This might include rethinking the way we fund access to justice initiatives, not only in terms of uh, in terms of the amount of money that's dedicated to these initiatives, but in terms of strategic areas of focus as well. That way we can get the benefits available to many to get to a point where we are not only talking about access to justice, but to get to a point where universal access to justice is a lived reality. A point at which I started my presentation, trying to get us to imagine what would such a world look like. And then finally, and this is an issue that's close to all our hearts, how can we use these technologies to meet the SDGs, and in our case, specifically SDG 16? And how can we use that to scale the technologies across borders, across the world, to enable everyone afford a Rolls Royce system of justice without necessarily having to have the amount of resources to purchase a Rolls Royce? I look forward to a wonderful engagement with you and thank you for listening. Thank you, Gerald, for bringing this uh, very important dimension of new and emerging technologies uh, into our discussion. And uh, in particular, uh, thinking about the need for, for equal access to these new uh, technologies. Uh, so we come to uh, our final uh, speaker and the first round of interventions by our panels. Uh, a very powerful uh, speaker we've reserved for last, someone who really needs no introduction to those of us working in the rule of law and uh, justice field. It's really an honor to introduce um, Sir Diego Garcia Sayan, Special Rapporteur of the United Nations Human Rights Council and the UN General Assembly on the independence of judges and lawyers. Diego was appointed Special Rapporteur in 2016, um, following his terms as President and Vice President of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. A native of Peru, uh, Mr. Garcia Sayan was Minister of Justice during the democratic transition in Peru and Minister of Foreign Affairs. Diego will share with us his thinking on the impact of the pandemic um, on the justice sector, which will be the subject of his next annual report to the Human Rights Council coming up in June this year. Uh, Diego, you have the floor. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to have the possibility to participate in this uh, uh, forum, which is fantastic because of all the participants uh, here and the possibility to, to see again a very good uh, old friends like Mona Rishmawi. Nice to see you uh, again, Mona. And really, we have heard very key and fantastic uh, presentations that in a way uh, allows me to, to follow up what has been uh, already, already said. Uh, and congratulations. Uh, I, I DLO for uh, choosing this uh, this matter today, and for course, thanks for the invitation and for the missions in Geneva that are sponsoring this meeting uh, as well. Uh, access of justice uh, to justice for all is a key matter. It was a, a very relevant matter before the pandemic, and it's increasingly relevant now. Uh, before the pandemic, there was more than one billion and a half uh, people in the world that were excluded from any justice system, any, any institutional, any formal justice system. So finally, and a special rapporteur has to do with only part of what happens in the world because they are excluded, many millions of people excluded from, uh, from justice 
that happened before the pandemic. What the, what the pandemic has uh, generated is more exclusion uh, than before, for many reasons, many of them that has been mentioned uh, now. Uh, justice system paralyzed uh, because of the lockdowns. Uh, almost in no country it was uh, considered by law an essential service to be protected and guaranteed. Uh, second, the biggest backlog of unsolved cases that uh, was generated, so increasing the problems that we have already in most uh, of the world. Uh, immediate responses and reactions uh, using internet, the new technologies generated their own problems. Uh, Gerald Avila has just mentioned uh, some of them that has uh, added these problems of exclusion with their own problems. People don't have access to internet, the guarantees of due process and uh, free uh, and, and uh, discreet access to a lawyer during this Zoom process are not, of course, guaranteed. Uh, gender and domestic violence, on which we have received uh, today very relevant uh, views and information. Uh, ASA, which is not uh, with us anymore, has mentioned uh, dramatic figures of what uh, was going and what is going on in, in, in the world regarding gender and domestic uh, violence uh, and finally the prison systems hmm? in which nobody has the real figure how many uh, detained persons have died because of the uh, impact of the pandemic hmm? there are some figures of the us i have the figures in my own country not less than 400 uh, detained pe uh, people died uh, because of, of uh, they, they, they they got sick hmm? so uh, when as a reporter I found all these uh, facts that there were of course not at, at this level now in 2021 but it sound was more than obvious that this was a very relevant uh, additional problem for justice uh, in the world so that under, under this collapse uh, when I decided to prepare the next report uh, as, uh, as it has been uh, recalled for this year regarding the impact of the pandemic and especially the challenges that this brings for the justice systems uh, worldwide. Of course, excluding these idyllic visions, simplistic vision, I know that it was only a sickness that will pass, that the vaccine will arrive, and uh, everybody will be happy uh, as ever in 2021, which was absolutely baseless uh, regarding the evolution of facts and regarding especially what science were offering us day by day to say, well, you are dealing with one of the biggest problems in the last century, you should deal with that as a major problem. So uh, different uh, aspects has, uh, have uh, uh, emerged as a consequence. I, I have mentioned some of them. And of course, this has been a fantastic, I would say, quote unquote, fantastic context for increasing the attacks against uh, lawyers, uh, against independent judges and prosecutors in different parts of the world. I, I, there's no need that I mention countries right now, but ev uh, that's evident that this has emerged. Uh, even the Supreme Court in the Philippines uh, has just uh, rung the bell uh, some days ago to say, well, uh, many judges and lawyers have been attacked and killed in the Philippines. We must stop that. That not begun before, not begun before the, 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 the pandemic, of course, but it has been a context in which all these authoritarian views have had much more uh, bigger bank of, uh, march of maneuver and the second aspect corruption what uh, is called in many in many in many countries in latin america and africa uh, uh, covid billionaires no? in which uh, using additional resources that have been provided to fight uh, the, the the pandemic in this context of uh, collapse of the justice system that has increased impunity so more than ever to connect as the as rapporteur i have been in, uh, insisting since the beginning of my mandate to connect the basic principles of 1985 to recent uh, uh, evolutions in international law and problems like corruption and the convention against corruption against a major uh, uh, challenge for actions of independent for independent judges and lawyers is more than ever a very relevant and significant uh, aspect to, to say so uh, to be brief and not extend too much, because really 
I look forward for that debate that may follow in, in what I, I have heard for uh, that, well, what people, the people that have preceded me is, is so clear and so fantastic that I, I, I am not, uh, no need to say uh, too, many, too many things. But uh, what are, will be some of the things that uh, could be in our agenda, things uh, that must be done to uh, uh, face these uh, challenges that come from history that have increased with, with the, the pandemic? Of course, access for all uh, in the justice system could be, could be the, the main uh, motto, uh, not with formalistic uh, responses, but increasing, strengthening uh, states' obligations uh, to guarantee uh, access to justice. And I could mention several aspects, but for, the, for this occasion, I will mention quickly only five aspects that could be perhaps a, a, a priority. First, Justice must be considered an essential service and its personnel, judges, prosecutors, and people around, uh, lawyers dealing with the justice system, should be considered part of an essential service so to guarantee minimum uh, protection, minimum uh, safeguards, and of course, a place in the vaccination process that it's taking very complex procedures and mechanisms all around the world. Not, not only in, uh, in Latin America or, 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 or in Africa. And of course, this way in which to confront it means that additional resources are necessary uh, in most countries of the world. So justice system is not an accessory component of society and institution, should be considered a key aspect to, to guarantee this value of uh, um, essential services as are maybe the police or, or doctors or, or people working in hospitals. Uh, second, matter that uh, Gerald has uh, mentioned very clearly, so I will be very brief, that new technologies, no? um, which is great. Hmm? So many hearings uh, have taken place, uh, uh, are taking place all around the world by, by Zoom. Uh, most of the, these meetings uh, fantastic because they begin uh, on time, but exclusion is uh, living under a new wave because in most countries, uh, the gap, the technological gap is huge because there is no access to internet, there is no training, not only uh, among the society in general, but even, even among uh, judges and lawyers. So, it's a matter of question that, that has to do with public and private investment uh, as uh, uh, confronting this uh, technological gap of one of the major priorities now to uh, have a biggest and more consistent access uh, to justice. It means not only access to what we have, because there are many procedures, many programs, very technological programs that, that has, have not been built or designed for justice procedures. So the guarantees of due process and all the, the guarantees of um, discrete access to a lawyer are not protected by using many of the technological and available uh, systems that we have in the world, for instance, uh, like Zoom, the one we are, uh, we are, we are, we are using now. Uh, so it has to do with access to, to, to technology and third, to the procedures, so, so this, Technological means that has have to do with judicial procedures, and we, we, we considering that in principle most of these systems have not been designed for judicial procedures. Fourth, um, gender-based violence uh, or gender orientation-based violence. All the violence has to do not only with gender, with uh, children, um, and, 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 the, and the criminal situations that worldwide are facing mainly impunity and the lack of possibilities of access of the victims in the figures that uh, Asa has just mentioned, five-fold increase in domestic violence in the last months. That is a, a, an extreme situation that requires special institutional responses that in the process I have been re receiving information uh, for the preparation of this report. Of course, I have seen some relevant efforts in some countries uh, of the world, but not enough, because that means uh, systematic goals and that means systematic uh, resources. 
And finally, uh, prisons. Huh? Uh, since the beginning, as a reporter, I uh, prepare um, a, a, a public uh, statement about the need uh, to relieve this big press pressure of uh, the, the prison system in worldwide, in which first, in many, many countries, uh, a big portion of uh, people in prison were people under preventive detention, not people already convicted. Uh, in some Latin American countries, 50% uh, of the prison population. And in many, many cases, uh, most women that are uh, in prison because of minor drug offenses is what uh, fools the prisons in Colombia, Peru, uh, uh, and Bolivia. Uh, many people have uh, suffered of, uh, um, uh, of, of, uh, for the virus, many people have died. So, uh, in which, of course, gender as well has been a special victim in this aspect. No radical uh, uh, worldwide uh, reaction has, ha has been taken. So to confront and to say what well, preventive detention has to be used only exceptionally. And as a reporter, I, may, I, I announced in April last year, uh, all the uh, people in prison because of political reasons should be released, should be released from this uh, uh, improper uh, situation. So uh, to, to finalize, you know, we have uh, an, an agenda uh, which is not new. We are, I am not reinventing the wheel at all. I am just placing that, that we are in a, the most dramatic situation that, situation that any of us may have seen or live along our personal and professional experiences uh, accelerated by the pandemic. We need more resources. We need more transparency. We need more priorities to say, well, justice system is a basic thing in a democratic society. This is the response to the need of the people. If you want to confront uh, gender exclusion, exclusion because of ethnical reason, because of racial reason, because of social reason, because the poor are excluded, you need to put resources now. So it's a great uh, great idea to organize this, this meeting because we, we, we really need to push forward because we are trying uh, to, to say things, and to define objectives which are not in favor of the wind, not in favor of the waves. Hmm? Perhaps the priorities logically is now to improve the health system, to improve the possibilities of vaccinate uh, the societies. Of course, that's absolutely legitimate and that is very proper. But please, if people like us don't press a lot and don't make some noise regarding the relevance of justice in this context in which the motto, congratulations again, justice, access for all is a thing in which we should strengthen the possibility to continue to act as a team. Congratulations to IDLO and really uh, thank you very much for the possibility, the generous possibility to share with you this, uh, uh, to have heard all this fantastic presentation that we have heard uh, today. Uh, and thank you, thank you. Uh, very much. Thank you very much, Diego, really for your words, but also for your work. And we very much look forward to seeing your report to, to the Council in June. I think that your remarks have really linked up very much uh, the, uh, the interventions from all, from all of our speakers. And I'm pleased now to open a discussion with, uh, with our audience uh, participants. Uh, I've already received um, some questions. Um, and the first one uh, is coming from uh, Ambassador Silvia uh, Alfaro Espinosa. She's the permanent representative of Peru to the United Nations in Geneva. So Ambassador, you have the floor. Hello, good afternoon, thank you. Can I, can I uh, be seen? Can I be heard? Oh, you can, you we can certainly hear you. Ah, now we see you. Welcome, Ambassador. Oh, thank Go you, ahead. thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Jan Bigel, IDLO, as well as the Office of High Commissioner. I, I thank you very much uh, for organizing this panel discussion, uh, which uh, Peru is uh, glad to co-sponsor. Uh, I express uh, our gratitude to Honorable Michael Kirby for his keynote address, as well as the panelists 
for the important contributions to the ongoing discussion in preparation uh, of the third session of the Forum on Human Rights, Democracy and the Rule of Law, which has been postponed until November this year. I would also like to add a special word and thanks to my compatriot and my dear friend, Mr. Dr. Diego Garcia Sayan, as you mentioned, uh, he, he was a former Minister of Justice and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Peru and former judge at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and now a uh, special rapporteur on the United Nations on, on the independence of judges and lawyers. And thank you very much, uh, Diego, for taking part today and sharing your views and valuable experiences with us. Peru, together with Romania, Morocco, Norway, and the Republic of Korea and Tunisia, uh, Peru is glad to be a part of, of the core group of the resolution that established the Forum of Human Rights, Democracy, and the Rule of Law in 2015, and that as assigned the themes of the editions of the Forum held in 2016 on the role of youth in public decision-making and in 2018 on the role of parliaments in promoting human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. I am also glad to announce that this week, the Human Rights Council adopted the resolution to set the theme for fourth edition of the forum, strengthening democracies to build back better challenges and opportunities. And this is scheduled for 2022. In March, 2019, well, the Human Rights Council adopted the resolution 40 in uh, slash nine and set the theme for the third edition for the forum, we could have never foreseen the unprecedented challenges that COVID pandemic would bring. Today, as all nations are focused on the recovery from the pandemic, the theme access to justice for all has taken on a new and more pressing relevance. And you have all told us how this is relevant more than ever today. Access to justice together with the rule of law are key components to peace, good governance, human rights, democracy and sustainable development. And as such is a vital cornerstone for all of our efforts to build back better. The discussions today, identifying both best practices as well as future challenges are an important starting point. The pandemic has negatively affected vulnerable populations disproportionately in such fundamental issues as healthcare, economic and social welfare, as well as their access to justice. At the same time, it has forced us to use innovative means to reach these populations. For example, last March 8th, on the occasion of International Women's Day, the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights of Peru launched a campaign to provide legal assistance to women using virtual means. It managed to answer over 14,000 legal consultations across the whole country and held virtual sessions addressing, among other issues, legal awareness of women's rights. With this in mind, I would like to pose a question to the panelists related to the importance of adapting justice systems to the needs of specific populations. As, as we have heard uh, Honorable Kirby and also Dr. Gerald, they have mentioned, um, this, the, the specific populations as women, children, young people, and other key populations as migrants, this, uh, persons with disabilities, refugees, indigenous peoples. To what extent do the panelists think technical innovation will have an effective impact on improving access to justice for, for vulnerable populations, accelerating the application of e-justice mechanisms, and how must these be adapted to cater to the needs of specific vulnerable populations. I would also uh, like to mention that justice in general terms and remembering Honorable Kirby on this Rolls-Royce and Volkswagen um, uh, 
um, mentioning. Um, I, I, I do share with Gerald the same view that I wish my country could have a bicycle system of justice as well. And I think it, 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 it doesn't matter if it's one system or the other to have a Rolls Royce or Volkswagen or bicycle system. It depends on how do we look at the society in an ethical way. It depends on how educated the society is and how the level of ethics. And I would like also to ask the panelists if, do, if you do share the idea that it, it really doesn't depend on what kind of system of justice, of, 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 of legal systems you have, but it depends uh, on the way you look at the way you look at, at the living in general terms and how do you have to apply the, the justice in a general natural way to the people. So sometimes we do see that developed countries and developing countries, we do defer in how do we apply justice because some people say that in developed countries, the justice is really accountable. While in developing countries, we do lack this part of the justice. We do lack in accountability. And this is the great difference between being developed uh, being, and being uh, developed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, and thank you also for, for being uh, not only a, a, a member of the, uh, of the Council uh, Forum Group, but also a member party of Ideologue. And we value our cooperation with you. I'm going to take uh, just a small group uh, of questions and then, then come back uh, to the panel so that everyone in the panel could, um, could give, their, give their views as they, as they would like on the different questions. So the next uh, person is Ms. Francesca Restifo um, from the International Bar Association Human Rights Institute. Uh, you have the floor. Is she there? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much. Please go ahead. Thank you. So thank you very much, Ms. Beagle. And I would like also to thank the um, IDLO and uh, OHCHR uh, for inviting the Bari and uh, also all the, um, the panelists for the incredibly interesting interventions. Um, the Bari has been um, involved in the organizations of, uh, of previous forums, and uh, we will be also happy to offer our collaboration for the upcoming, upcoming one uh, in November. Um, with uh, in relation to the, um, the discussions, I would um, like to, to mention that uh, late last year, the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute, the IBARI, has carried out a survey in uh, 38 different jurisdictions uh, all over the world on the impact of COVID-19 uh, emergency powers on the administration of justice, rule of law and the human rights. And uh, so just to second, I will not now uh, speak about the, 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 the results of the survey, but just to second what Mona, uh, Gerald and the special rapporteur and the others have, have mentioned that the survey confirmed that once more, the most affected by the pandemic in terms of access to justice are, are the most economically depressed sectors, uh, refugees, undocumented migrants, women, children, and persons with disabilities. All groups this that whose access to justice was already restricted and challenged even before the pandemic, how Mona has already uh, very clearly mentioned. And uh, so I'm, I'm not now, I don't want to repeat the questions that Hader has, um, has already, have already put forward, but it would be really interesting to, for, for the forum to discuss really concrete ways in which we can overcome this, um, uh, this further exacerbation and, uh, and ensure that they can, uh, these groups can jump on the, on the road floor. It's referred to by Justice Michael Corby. Uh, it would be... So we would really appreciate if the forum could really include a session on options and good practices in relations also to participation as Mona has, uh, um, has mentioned, but also equal access to te technology and how to fill the technology gaps. Uh, 
Um, I have just another short uh, comment or, or questions for, for the panel that uh, as a consequence of the social economic impact of uh, COVID-19, justice systems may be immensely uh, affected, including uh, uh, their independence due to the financial restrictions. Uh, and uh, in particular, some, uh, for example, criminal justice systems or justice for people such as immigrants and asylum seekers uh, uh, could be a favorite uh, target by politicians in times of financial constraints. And I would like to ask the, the panelists, uh, what measures do you think that should be taken to prevent or to address this? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the next, the next uh, speaker is uh, Ms. Martina Katarina um, from UNHCR. You have the floor. Perfect. Thank you so much. And uh, we can uh, thank you so much for, for the opportunity to take the floor. And thank you, everyone, for the presenters for this very sort of rich and inspiring uh, presentation. Um, my name is Martina Catrina. I work for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees as the global focal point on law and policy on internal displacement. And in that capacity, I also chair the task team on law and policy under the Global Protection Cluster. So I just wanted to make a comment in relation um, to the work really that the task team uh, um, is doing on this uh, at the moment. And of course, uh, IDLO uh, is a very active member of the task team as well, um, which brings together mainly humanitarian partners, but also uh, human rights organization and development organization that are working on this subject. And one of the things, so we've been working over the years to support governments in developing uh, legal and policy frameworks for the protection of people in displacement and humanitarian um, crisis, um, and looking at now the implementation and supporting implementation of these frameworks, and also looking at really the people-centered work that a lot of our organizations are doing in the field around legal aid and access to justice, we have decided really to come together as uh, partners working across the spectrum of uh, different protection areas, whether it is gender-based violence, uh, child protection, housing, land and property, trafficking, um, but really to come together in the task team on law and policy to really look at how, what can we do better to, 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 to expand access to justice for people in humanitarian settings, basically. Um, and so I I just really wanted to, to, to flag this. It's not always an, an easy sell uh, because when it comes to humanitarian priorities, a lot of other priorities, uh, but in fact, uh, of course, all, all these areas have an essential uh, legal aid component and then in the work that we do. Um, and so we really will be using the, the task team as a platform moving forward uh, to have this conversation with everyone. Um, and we really just wanted to flag this and uh, we, we hope that we will be able to work with many of you uh, moving forward on this on this subject um, and I just leave it at that thank you so much thank you so much for joining us and, and really the importance of the multi-stakeholder uh, approach I don't think can be overemphasized and maybe the last uh, speaker before I turn back um, to our distinguished panel um, is um, Judge Susan Yakran from Afghanistan you have the floor Hello, everyone. Good evening. It's the evening in Afghanistan. Um, I have a question from Adila. Mr. Adila, uh, who was talking about technology which can help people, ordinary people, to access to justice. Um, I just only um, heard about her from the uh, Mr. Adela that he, he was uh, uh, provide this opportunity for people to access the justice to technology, but he, he didn't uh, mention and he um, didn't give any example that how technology can help people to um, access to justice because I'm working in Afghanistan, and uh, in Afghanistan, uh, people um, uh, are mean to come to the courts. You know, for example, women, men, and women uh, came to the court um, face to face, 
and the bring their cases and their uh, um sorry i i think that to, we are losing you but i think we have your question uh, which is the kind of examples that we might have of the way in which to be uh, evaluated enable uh, access uh, to justice I'm going to turn back now to, to our panel. I think we have some very interesting uh, comments uh, and questions, and I will come back to each of you, and maybe I will start the opposite way from uh, how, we, how we came. So I'll, I will start with Diego, then go to Gerald, and then go to uh, Dihan, and then uh, go to, to Mona. Um, and please take whichever aspects of the questions uh, that you would like to uh, address. So let me start with you, Diego, please. Thank you, thank you, Dan. Pleasure to see, see you again, Ambassador uh, Alfaro. You, your questions are very, very relevant, very proper, and I will, I will respond simultaneously to your question, the questions placed by Francesca Restifo, because both have to do more or less with a, a connected matter. First, uh, a question of uh, priorities in a context in which everything uh, is being affected in the justice system, of course those social areas in which the impact has been uh, worse, hmm? that means uh, gender-based uh, violence, poor uh, ethnical uh, discrimination, racial discrimination, uh, that would should deserve a priority. I, I mentioned that in my first statement uh, one year ago, made in, in April, that certain areas should be part of uh, special attention, including, of course, any uh, matters of dealing with cases of corruption uh, connected to the extraordinary resources uh, linked to the, to, the, to, the, to the pandemic. One aspect which I would sustain now, one year after that, in which the situation has, uh, has uh, worsened. Second, of course, that uh, raises uh, a difficult thing to solve. No? Uh, how that works if there is some institutional and structural difficult of access. Uh, uh, the justice system is not spread all around uh, the place, uh, technology is not accessible, so that places a need, but that while all these uh, investments, uh, all this training on new technologies is done, you know, uh, the, the inventing uh, simple simplification of procedures so that uh, all these situation of crisis can be a matter of access to the justice system which will require, thirdly, that a clear policy to, as, as I mentioned in my, in my presentation, to deal with the justice system as a special service. If that is not possible because of institutional reasons, because of budgetary constraints, at least dealing with all these specific, extraordinary areas of the society that have been particularly and especially affected by the, by the pandemic. And last but not least, all of this, so to prevent inabilities, so to prevent uh, corruption with transparency, full transparency in how additional resources are being invested, how all these new uh, procedures uh, for to, to, to act in, uh, um, to benefit these excluded sectors uh, could be transmitted to the society with uh, efficient ways of communication through radio, through cell phones, cell phones are much more spread in the world then internet and technology, so invent mechanisms as uh, banks do, as Amazon has to sell things. Well, you can use that mechanism as well to uh, establish contact with uh, certain authorities to prevent or to react. So major things, it's easier to say it right now than to implement it in, in the short run, but trying to, to, to respond to the, the, the very relevant uh, matters that have been raised in the question. I don't want to spend any more because I'm looking at the, at the clock and we are all, uh, uh, extending uh, further our, our limit. Thank you, thank you, Jan. Thank you so much, Diego. I turn to Gerald, please. Thank you for, for that and for the wonderful uh, questions that have come in. Uh, specifically, I'll start with uh, Ambassador Silvia Alfaro's question, which is what extent do panelists think uh, technical innovation 
to have an impact on access to justice and how these can be adopted to cater for needs of specific populations. And then I'll turn to a question raised by Judge Susan Yakrang. Um, to Ambassador Sylvia's question, I believe technical innovations, at least from the innovations we know and from the innovations that we are yet to see, will have a tremendous impact on access to justice. And barefoot law is an example. We've been doing this for close to 10 years. I believe, uh, from the experience that I've gathered, I believe for us to see this impact, it's a multi-pronged approach. We need to use uh, these technologies to improve the quality of uh, justice services, while at the same time using these technologies to ensure the most fundamental need, which is the creation of access to justice. We can also approach it from a systems change perspective, that is uh, by sharing some of this data and finding to try and ensure improvement of policy and legislation governing the use of these new technologies uh, and emerging technologies as well to create more access. For example, we can use forums like this and uh, those that are upcoming to ensure the passing of legislation both at uh, a global level and at a local level to ensure access so that no one gets left behind. I mentioned this a bit in my presentation to ensure data protection, to ensure governments focus on enabling access to technologies, internet provision or mobile phone penetration in rural and hard to reach areas. This should be advocated for as a fundamental human right. And it's because of these that Barefoot Law and our partners across the divide advocate for the Tool Declaration on the use of AI and ML, or at least artificial intelligence and machine learning for social good. The Darkstall Declaration deals on principles such as the Toronto Declaration and the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals to call on those working on uh, AI for social good projects or new and emerging technologies to understand the potential discrimination against and vulnerabilities of the users, beneficiaries, and the people potentially affected by these technologies. Over 100 experts have signed up to this, and I would like to request that we each take a look and include this in the projects that we are carrying out. Now, specifically to the question on judge, the question by Judge Susan. Through the innovative use of digital technologies, Barefoot Law works to empower people to develop legal solutions for their justice needs. So I want us all in uh, utilizing technology and innovation, think how can I come up with technology, both existing and emerging, to enable people to develop legal solutions to the problems that they face. At Barefoot Law, we do this first by broadcasting the law to our beneficiaries through multiple channels from the most basic like SMS and FM radio, as well as community engagement programs where we go out, uh, inform people about the law and inform them how to access the law using Barefoot Law tools. For instance, the SMS, just send an SMS with law space your question to 6556 and it will come to us a group of trained advocates provide responses and send that back to you. Now the technologies uh, range from the most basic, like I said, uh, to a bit more complicated technologies. From the most basic like FM radio and SMS, all the way to a more complicated like machine learning and AI. Just about two weeks ago, we were privileged to host uh, uh, Patricia Scotland, the secretary, general of uh, the Commonwealth who came to Barefoot Law and launched version two of Winnie, our AI system. Now for us, the question is how do we get Winnie, our AI lawyer, to provide access to justice in an area where there is even no internet, an area without mobile phone connectivity. And I would like us all in the countries and regions in which we operate, try and think about the specific needs of that population the specific needs of the technology available and creatively think solutions, but we need to be bold. And that's, uh, that's a bit of that. I'm very happy to continue this discussion and just feel free to reach out to me. I'll be able to provide you a bit of more material in this regard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gerald. And I, I hope Dian could um, excuse me just for one minute because we're running a little bit over and I know that Mona um, has to leave to another meeting. So if I just give her a uh, time for a brief word before she has to leave and then I'll come to come to you, Diane. So Mona, you have the floor. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jan, and thank you very much for all the great presentations and all the great work uh, that everyone is doing. Just two notes on the digital, not digital. I think two, th two, two, two things to keep in mind. I think we need a combined approach because there is a digital divide. There is a digital divide, and it's a big one. And I think, as Diego told us, I think there is the people who do not have access to the internet or adequate internet in many countries have suffered tremendously during this time. So we cannot put everything in the digital world. It's important, but we cannot put everything in that. So access to justice have to take that into account. We, we do need to reach, out, to reach to people to, and to convince them that really going through a justice process is really the way forward for everyone for to help dealing with all kinds of problems and so it has justice have to have a human face and therefore has to adjust to the human needs and if there is in addition to all the you know if there is the economic uh, uh, or a technological uh, disparities absolutely we have to deal with that and justice have to be able to deal with that so i think while we need to be very aware that we are in a changing world, we are in a revolutionary world around the technologies, this is not the same for everyone. And the inequalities in that, in that sphere is huge. I just want to end with that and thank you everyone and really thank you uh, IDLO for really a great, great, great uh, uh, panel to prepare for, our, for the forum. Uh, you know, that the incoming forum and uh, Diego for your report. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how we can take it forward. And uh, thank you. And we will continue the partnership with all of you. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. I'm really sorry. I have just another, frankly, I have some families of victims uh, who are waiting on the another, uh, another side and I just need to hear from them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mona, and thank you for your collaboration, which we will continue. Yeah. Uh, and Diane, please, you have the floor. And I'll make it very brief, um, Jan. All right, so I just wanted to comment as well on the question raised by Ambassador Alfaro on this whole issue of the digital um, divide and also the, um, the, the need for justice, access to justice systems to be innovative and adaptable and flexible. Um, I think that's a very excellent point, as were all the other questions, uh, because for me, as has been said by Mona just now, justice has to have a face. If you're not positively impacting those who are most affected and those who need redress and some kind of healing, then it means you're being ineffective. So I agree that we need to have digital platforms that really are assisting us with this whole technological need for support given the pandemic that we're in. But coupled with that, we need to have community interventions that are responsive to the needs of different communities, having profiled what those needs are. So mobile units, for example, would be very useful. Instead of having your office at a location which would normally service clients who come to you, how about having mobile units that are in those high-risk areas that have the greatest need? so that you are in the communities on the ground and they're able to access the services if they do not have access to digital solutions. So I think um, to close, we have to be adaptable, we have to be relatable, and we have to ensure that the visibility of the services that we offer in our various um, realms of access to justice uh, modalities are in fact very apparent to the persons who have the need. So my thing is a fused approach of digital, yes, profiling where greatest need is and using those community interventions to, to make the services accessible. Thank you. Um, before I close as well and, and mute my mic, I just want to go on record to thank the IDLO and the OHCRE for having convened this particular session and also for having invited me. Uh, just the very rich exchanges and contributions of all the panelists certainly have stimulated quite a lot of food for thought. And I think the November session will be very enriched by the contributions here. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And uh, as we bring today's discussion to, to a close, I really 
want to express our deep appreciation to Justice Kirby, of course, and to all of our panelists, some, some old friends and some new friends. And uh, I also want to thank uh, all of you who participated in the Zoom audience uh, today. Um, I'm not going to try to sum up. I think we all have our own takeaways um, from the, the different uh, speakers and the different questions, but I just thought maybe I'll, I'll give a, a couple of thoughts that came to my mind as I was listening um, to, each of, to each of the panelists and um, particularly when Mona uh, was talking about the need to increase trust in public institutions and how we can do that and how we can really have participation that's meaningful so we have truly people-centered justice and I think this is an issue that we do want to think more about as we move uh, towards the forum. Uh, uh, Asa of course talked about the gender justice gap and the need to keep that gender perspective in all of our work. I think we're very conscious of that. And Dihan really emphasized the importance of accountability in ensuring that the rule of law is respected and particularly uh, for vulnerable groups. And also uh, what she said just now about uh, creative solutions and being adaptable and uh, fusing different types of approaches, I think is very, is very relevant. And Gerald, of course, was, um, was very uh, compelling as usual on the, uh, how we can leverage these new and emerging technologies to achieve uh, access to justice for all, and particularly those who are the most vulnerable and the most marginalized. And um, uh, I thought it was very important what he said about we have to join international policy dialogues like this one with grassroots discussions and grassroots action. And actually, I, I would like to join him in uh, what he said about uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Being a, being a global public good and available uh, equitably to all. I think that we can, we can all uh, subscribe uh, to that. And of course, Diego um, drew out some of the multiple impacts of COVID-19, including um, attacks on lawyers and judges. And uh, I was sorry we couldn't hear so well the um, speaker from Afghanistan, because of course that is, that is one area where have, we have seen uh, these, terrible, these terrible attacks, but also I think, Diego, your emphasis on corruption and, um, you know, the other side of all of the stimuluses and everything is, is, the, is the corruption that has come about. And also what you said about the justice system being an essential service in societies. I think we could, we could give some more uh, thought towards that. And maybe then I end with uh, Justice Kirby uh, talking about the importance, as he said, of that little word, justice, uh, and the need to convert the language of resolutions into actual delivery of the rule of law and of human rights um, into a lived reality. And I think that is what it's all about. So IDLO looks forward um, to continuing to partner with all of you, um, continuing to um, discuss these issues. We look forward uh, to the forum um, and to really um, make that an opportunity uh, to advance access to justice for all. So thank you all very much and stay safe uh, wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Bye, bye.